Welcome to the Sherman Show. I'm here, Jeff Sherman, with my co-host, Sam Lau. Hey, hey. And today we have a very special guest. We have Richard Bernstein. He is the CEO and CIO of Richard Bernstein Advisors. He founded the firm back in 2009 after spending a, a short little stint uh, on Wall Street, uh, over 40 years of experience. Uh, I remember reading a lot of the stuff you did as the chief investment strategist back at Merrill. Um, not, in addition to that, you have numerous accolades. We won't get into that. We don't have enough yeah. time, first of all. <laughs> uh, but also, I think what's interesting to a, a lot of our listeners and, and viewers, and, and today we're on YouTube again, if you want to uh, watch this uh, with our beautiful faces. Uh, but he wrote two books, uh, Style Investing, A Unique Insight into Equity Management, as well as Navigate the Noise, invest, Investing in the New Age of Media and Hype. But what's very interesting is you donate, donate all the profits of those proceeds to charities. So Absolutely. it's very, very commendable. And I mean, what, what better way to kick off a conversation today than start about talking about navigating the noise? <laughs> so, um, you know, why don't we talk about that to, to begin with and just uh, the new age of media and hype? What, what prompted you to write that book, first of all? And how applicable are those lessons that you learned or what you're trying to convey in there to, to our investors today? Oh, wow. Well, well, Sam and, and Jeff, thanks. Thanks so much for the invitation. It's great. Great to be with you today. You know, Jeff, I think um, I wrote that book 20 years ago, actually almost 21 years ago, which is amazing. And it was right around the tech bubble. And I was very concerned that investors were taking their eye off the ball, right? They weren't looking at fundamentals anymore. They weren't looking at earnings and cash flows and interest rates and all the things that really determine asset prices. Um, they, were, they were looking at hype, right? And I, I remember one of the lines that I used when I was at Merrill Lynch at the time was that I didn't understand how buying a green pepper on the internet was technology, but building a fighter plane was not, right? There were all these weird things going on and it just didn't make any sense. So I, I, what I, I ended up concluding that it was that the that, that there was all this hype, there was all this noise going on, and people weren't weren't looking at fundamentals. And what the book tried to 21 years ago, what it tried to focus on was, look, building wealth for an individual is not all that hard through time. There's some very simple things you should do. We know a well diversified portfolio held through the long term, multiple cycles, you're going to build wealth through time. As long as you're as long as you still believe in capitalism, you're going to you're going to do okay. And, but why don't people do it? And, and my conclusion was that there's all these kind of forces that try to distract you and get you to do the things that you shouldn't do. Now, is that applicable today? I think it's more applicable today. Oh, my, oh gee, I mean, it's like ridiculous today where you know people are, are trading on Robin Hood like fiends and, and have forgotten what, what the point is to the financial markets and how to truly build wealth and how it's a, a slow and steady process that you can actually master, but you know, people just don't do it. And so what are some of the core tenets there? We always talk about it's more important just to have a plan than really the execution of the plan too, or at mm -hmm. least to build a plan. People are so worried about the nuance. Should I, you know, should I invest in, in a certain name out there or, you know, what's going to give me the ability to double my money over the next year right. or two versus, versus these processes that you've laid out. So right. how, how has that changed since the book first came out? You know, I don't think that's ever changed, Jeff. You know, there's always a get rich quick scheme out there. I, I don't like to use the word scheme because it's got a negative connotation. And I'm not sure everybody that's that's putting forth these these strategies, if you will, is doing so uh, nefariously. But but I think there always is some kind of scheme out there, get rich quick. And, and that's just not what you should be doing in the financial market. That's not what it's about. And, um, you know, I don't think that, well, here's the, Jeff, here's the way that I, I describe it. I used to teach in the grad school at NYU. And one of the questions I used to ask the MBA students every semester was I would start and I would say, what's the difference between the stock market and a horse race? And I would, I would, I know you hope an MBA student would be able to answer that reasonably well. They always had trouble. They always had trouble because the way we talk about the stock market is like a horse race. I'm going to make a bet on company XYZ, right? No, you're not making a bet. You know, people forget when you buy shares in a company, you become a partial owner of the company. And what you should care about is the, the cash flows, the earnings, and eventual return on investment that you're going to get from that corporation's cash flows. And, and people forget that. And so, you know, I always tell people that uh, it's not like you're, you're betting on a horse 
it's like you're buying a horse. You're going to buy the horse. You're going to train it. You're going to you're going to run races with it. Eventually, you're going to put it out the stud. That's what the stock market's about. It's not a single race where you're going to make a, a you know three to one wager. Okay. Well, I, I like how you focus on the word scheme because it's always stuck in my craw. And this is being American versus being, you know, a Brit, where they call it their pension system the pension scheme. Right? Yes, and I exactly. hear that every time, and I think about, you know, the underfunded, you know, uh, the funding ratios, how underfunded our pension plans are. And, oh, right. I mean, those are more of a scheme than anything else. So, uh, exactly. That, that word is, yeah. But yeah, well put. You brought, you, you brought up your uh, your your stint as uh, as teaching MBA students at NYU at the Stern School, and I think that's another thing I've always appreciated too. Because you bring this, you marry the world of academia with being a practitioner as well. And I know you're in the advisory committee of the Journal of Portfolio Management. A critical reading, I think, out there for anyone that wants to have a career in, in portfolio management. I think what the, those um, the articles, the access in there is, is great. You've been a reviewer on the CFA curriculum. What, what is the key message that you try to do to transition from this world of academia to being a practitioner? Because you have a nice advisory business, you, you, you put it into practice, you've done very well. How is making that transition from academia to the world of a practitioner? Yeah, you know, Jeff, there's one of my colleagues at, at RBA, Richard Bernstein Advisors, RBA, says to me that no matter how good Derek Jeter was, he always took ground balls in spring training. Right. And and of course, I'm a Yankee fan. But but, you know, that I think that's critical to understanding that no matter how good you are, there's basic fundamentals that you have to hone and you have to do it time and time again. And what I've tried to impart uh, upon investors through my career at Merrill or or now at RBA, and my own team at RBA is that, you know, what you learn in business school isn't isn't like BS. It's not it's not things that you learn and then you forget there's there's it's the ground balls and and we have to understand that by taking ground balls in spring training we're going to hone our skills and you have to remember that by all of a sudden coming to the real world and and becoming an investment manager you shouldn't forget everything you learned before it's it's the principles upon which you should act not something that just got you an a or a b in school right and and i think people forget that all the time that that these basic um fundamental principles of finance, you know, that sometimes they seem very wacky, but but they do have applications in the real world. And I've always viewed it as my job to try to make that connection. Yeah. So on on that front, let's jump into the market side, because that's what that's what people want to hear from you, Rich. Of course. We know that. So <laughs> so let, let's jump into that too. Let's talk about those basics and the fundamentals and thinking about applying them to the markets today. So what we have here is a, a market that's been on fire off the lows mm. of last year, whether we talk about the bond market, we talk about credit products, we talk about equities, uh, we look at the rise of commodities once again. Um, how are you thinking about the fundamentals and, and what are they telling you in the marketplace today? And you so can pick I, any of those markets to start, yeah. Yeah, so Jeff, I kind of think in the equity market, we sort of have a bifurcated market going on right now where we have half the market that is perceived to be very exciting, very sexy, um, lots of lots of trading activity going on, I mean, and valuations are stretched by by virtually any measure that you want to use. Valuations seem stretched. Then we have this other half of the market, and and it's probably more than a half, but maybe the other seven tenths of the market is is sitting there with virtually nobody having much interest at all. And and I think that that in that that thirty percent, which is very hot and sexy, I don't think there's great opportunity at all. In the other seventy percent, I think there's tremendous opportunities, but nobody cares. And I I find that actually quite intriguing. And and what we've tried to do at RBA is shield ourselves as much as we can from the thirty percent, and try to take advantage of the seventy percent as as much as we possibly can. I think that's where the opportunities are. If I can add one thing though, Jeff, you know people go, well, what are you kidding? All the growth is in this thirty percent. All this growth is in the hot stuff. And my answer to that is maybe it is, maybe it's not. But when you're an investor, you're not buying the story. You're investing and, and the valuation of your investment has a huge impact on the return you should expect. And the example that I always love to give is that during the tech bubble, you know, 98, 99, 2000, there were tons of promises made about how technology would change our lives. And it did. In the next decade, virtually every promise that people said in the tech bubble came true except the tech sector over that decade was the worst performing sector in the United States. The worst. It was down in absolute terms for the decade. 
And so people forget that it's a story might well come true. It doesn't mean you're going to make money in the investment. And, and uh, I think that's an important point uh, for any individual investors that are watching this right now. I think I think I, I remember from last summer, I think it was you that put out, uh, I was watching something you were doing and you had said something along the lines of if you buy these certain stocks and they were the the, the sexy ones, right? The fangums. Mm -hmm. And you said, if you if you buy them right now and you're buying them at these multiples, you have to be extremely bearish on the world, yes. right? Yes. I think that was you, right? That you had that said was that me. too. Absolutely. And, and it, stuck, it stuck with me. And I was like, I, I never quoted you on it, but I just was like a highly respected strategist. You can, you can read through right. it. And, and so, uh, well, I think that's interesting. Maybe you can explain to some of our listeners, what do you mean there? Because they're sure. saying, wait, wait, if I buy the fangs and and these, you know, uh, what had been the Robin Hood stocks, you know, that were very mm -hmm. popular pre prior to this year, um, if buying at those multiples made you extremely bearish, it's like, wait a second, how does that reconcile with the narrative that was created? So maybe right. you can elaborate. So, so the way, you know, this goes back to work that we did all the way back in the late 80s, early 90s when I was at Merrill. And, and back then, there was a question that nobody could answer, like what was causing the cycles of growth and value, large and small, all these other things. Everybody knew they existed, but nobody really knew why they occurred and, and how you could try to play them. And, and so we kind of set out to try and figure that out. And what we, we, what we concluded way back then was that the profit cycle was the main determinant, not the economic cycle, but the profit cycle. And that when profit cycles peak and fall over, leadership in the marketplace gets very narrow. The markets become very Darwinistic, right? It becomes survival of the fittest. And investors gravitate towards the fewer and fewer companies that could maintain growth in what was an increasingly dire environment, right? And so what we said was, look, that's what's going on. The profit cycle is decelerating the United States. It was crushed by the pandemic on top of that. And we ended up with what I like to call the Fab Five. Right, the five or the 10 or the 15 companies, some people call them the fangs, whatever you want to call them. And, and my argument was that if you're buying the Fab Five, you have a very bearish outlook on the world because you're saying nothing else in the world is going to grow over the next year, two years, three years, whatever time horizon you want. And therefore, it's worth it to me to pay these super high multiples for this very few number of companies that are actually going to grow. In other words, the scarce resource. Right. And if, if growth is a scarce resource, you'll pay a high multiple and it's worth it. You know, like you, Bentleys are more expensive than Volkswagens. Right. And there's a reason Bentleys are scarce. Volkswagens are not. And and but if they started producing Bentleys like Volkswagens, the price of Bentleys would come down. It's the same thing when growth is scarce and the future looks bleak. You should be willing to pay a very high multiple for the few companies that can grow. Our view was it's just not that bad. <laughs> And, and that, you know, if you look at a year or two years or three years, the economy was going to come back to some degree. And we could argue about what that degree would be, but it wasn't going to be that bad. And the opportunities were not in the FANG type names, the Fab Five names, because that was such a bearish view of the future. We couldn't imagine that that was the right outcome. No, and I, I, as I said, I took it to heart. And I forget where you're being interviewed, but I took it to heart and I, I used it for a while. So yeah, okay. um, for, for, for our clients that have heard that, now you know the true source of uh, Yeah, that's okay. Um, but uh, on that note too, we, we mentioned your your other book too, The Style Investing, which is, mm -hmm. I really thought it was one of those seminal pieces of the style boxes and really, you know, getting into those strategies. So right. let, let's, let's, let's pivot into that a little bit and talk about, the value growth kind of uh, story too. So we've seen right. growth outperform for so long. Um, what does it take for value to outperform again? Um, is it just mismeasurement? There's all these theories about it. Um, it's just out of favor. How are you approaching it as someone who's really thought about these different styles? Right. So this is this is akin to the period when we actually did all this research in the in the 89-90 recession. Value managers got their faces ripped off. I mean, absolutely destroyed in terms of performance. I remember there was a very popular uh, value shop that had grown tremendously, and they went from like 11 or 12 billion in assets all the way down to three in a very short period of time. I mean, it was just a horrific period for value investing, but nobody could really figure out why. And I was kind of the little squid at Merrill. I wasn't a senior guy at all. And I figured if there's a way to make a name for myself, I should solve this problem. And if I can figure out that problem, it's like a business goal case study, right? Do you want to be a niche player? You know, how are you going to compete with Coke and Pepsi? And so the idea was 
how, answer this question. It was going to be of great importance, at least to the value world, maybe to everybody. And let's try and figure it out. And and I think that's where we are today. We're, um, you know, we're in a period where profitability had been slowing. Uh, profit cycle really peaked in 2018. It had started to slow. People didn't really care, but the fundamentals were starting to slow. They weren't bad, but we weren't. We didn't have an accelerating economy, accelerating profitability anymore. It was starting to decelerate. Nobody cared. And then we hit the pandemic. And uh, as I said before, profits got crushed. The unfortunate thing to go along with that is that every marketing person and their brother has now taken that up and started talking about a new era of innovation and disruption. And my argument is there is no new era. It's just simply the profit cycle decelerating. Companies that can maintain their growth rates have maintained their growth rates. And we've had this Darwinistic approach to investing and that it, it's, it's perfectly explained, you know, in a pandemic, this is kind of what should happen. And, and, but the other side is that, that profits are, are rebounding. They're going to rebound. I think everybody expects them to rebound. Why would you expect such narrow leadership? You know, the, I always tell people, and this is so ridiculously obvious, the cycle by definition is determined by cyclicals. <laughs> so, I mean, Through it sounds word, stupid, yeah. right? It <laughs> sounds stupid, but it does work. And so we just went through a horrific period where profits got crushed. You don't want cyclicals in that kind of an environment. But if you think the profits are going to rebound, then you want to own cyclicals. You want to own value. You want to own small. You want to own low quality. You know, these are all the things that, that people should be looking at. And, and as you guys know better than I do, very often the bond market leads the stock market. So the quality effects are starting have been picked up in the bond market already. You've seen spreads narrowing as people have expected, um, you know, uh, profitability to turn and cash flows to, to uh, get stronger. That's, that's kind of the cyclical environment. That's what should happen. It's just the pandemic made it seem very extreme. And unfortunately, the marketing people have gone off and created this whole buzz about innovation and disruption. Not, not that I'm at all jealous of the people who have been able to raise such huge amounts of money in weeks, um, but I'm not sure that's the healthiest way to invest. <laughs> yeah, um, some of those firms too may be larger than our combined firms uh, in the next, by the end of the quarter at, at the rate they're going. As well, right? Exactly. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, it's it's funny, you, you mentioned uh, being a squid and not in a negative context, like a vampire squid. I appreciate yeah. that. And then the yeah. other thing I appreciate was you bring up the idea of the new era and it reminds me of, of those um, quotes that you get from Bob Farrell, right? Where, you know, there is no new regime, right? Right, and exactly. So, so when we think about that and realize there is really nothing new under the sun and you're looking to deploy capital for your, your clients right now, mm -hmm. how are you thinking about the risk to the equity market, the risk to portfolios? Or sure. I, I guess said differently, what do you see as some of the larger risks to overall portfolio allocation today? And I've heard people say, well, it's valuation on equities, well, it's valuation on bonds, how low yields are. Mm. What are you thinking about? What are some of the key risks that you're trying to manage today? So, so for us, you know, I, I think the way to think about the way we're structured right now and our portfolios are structured, it's, we're not paying as much attention to the market per se, but rather to that bifurcated market that I mentioned before. So we are... Um, very, uh, I won't say very, we are, we have been reasonably aggressive in structuring our portfolios on that cyclical value side. You know, we are overweight energy. We've been overweight energy for quite some time, overweight materials, overweight industrials, overweight small cap value, overweight financials, overweight, uh, developed market, mid cap and small cap stocks, non-China EM, you know, even, even emerging market high yield has been in our portfolio for a while now, you know, as we're trying to take advantage of some of those, those opportunities there as well. That's very different from where we were a year ago or a year and a half ago. A year, a year and a half ago, our portfolios were all large cap, high quality, consumer staples, health care, you know, dividend safe dividend paying stocks you know things like that it's like it's it's like 180 degrees different from where we were uh, a year ago at this time and and i think that's just because the environment is 180 degrees away now you know are we worried about the market overall yeah i mean you have to pay attention to what could happen if the 30% really craters and starts dragging everything else down with it. We have liquidity problems and, and everything's always draining. Yes. So in our multi-asset portfolios, we're overweight equities, but not a lot. You know, our, our biggest portfolio, the benchmark is 50% equities. I think right now we're about 
55 or 57 percent equity. Not where we were several years ago, where we really thought we were in the heat of a bull market, blah, blah, blah. And we were like 70 percent equities or 75 percent equities, nothing like that. But but we do have a, a, a lot of cyclicality in the portfolio, even though the equity weight is not necessarily that high overall. Yeah, and it, it seems like you know some of the areas that you talked about, you know, you're moving into some of the, I suppose, so-called non-traditional areas within equities and within mm -hmm. you know the fixed income space, and that just kind of makes me think back to what we talked about earlier in the segment at the top of the hour with the hype, you know, the yes. things that are out there, and it seems like as valuations get stretched and you know as people are looking at their fixed income portfolio and just wondering where the income is more and more are looking for alternatives to even yes. these non-traditional sectors of the of the financial markets. So that's given rise to areas like cryptocurrencies, which yep. you know, we can have that debate all day long, whether or not you think <laughs> it belongs in the portfolio or if it's even the uh, financial asset, uh, and also SPACs. So I suppose, you know, is that a hype? Is that just a, a trending fad? And uh, does it have a place in the portfolio, in, a, you know, in an investment portfolio today? Right. So, so I would say, look, with cryptocurrencies, I, I don't, you know, could they have a role in, in the economy over the next 5, 10, 15 years? Uh, maybe they can, maybe they, maybe they don't. I, I honestly don't know. I'm I, not quite sure anybody could know, but, but, um, but I, I'll say I'm skeptical, but maybe it will. You know, I don't know. I'm pretty agnostic on that. However, I think as an investment today, I think for me personally, I think it's kind of loony. I, I, I just don't think that you should be backing up the truck and, and you know, or, you know, you're one of these companies that takes your, your, you finally have some free cash flow and you take it and you invest it all in Bitcoin. That to me does not seem prudent. Um, and I don't think people should do that. And I think, again, think of the story of the tech bubble and what happened after the tech bubble, how the story came true, but you lost money in the investments. Maybe that's going to happen with cryptocurrencies. You know, if we take away the hype, maybe there is a real story underneath there. Maybe, you know, in 10 years, we're all going to be dealing in Bitcoin and we won't be dealing in dollars and we won't have normal credit cards anymore. I think that maybe that is. I don't, I don't really know. But that doesn't mean I'm going to make money in Bitcoin by investing it today. And that's that's a very important difference. And, and so there the SPACs, um, you know, look, I'm I'm. I, I think people have enough trouble understanding companies that do have fundamentals. Um, I don't quite understand why people would buy stocks of companies that are, have nothing. I mean, call me crazy on that one. I mean, some of them are going to work, of course, and some of them aren't. But it seems to me that you got to leg up when there actually are fundamentals that you can examine. But, you know, that, that may be very old fashioned. Yeah, I think I think we hit peak tongue in cheek in the SPAC market today where the listing is a uh, there's a company that came out today. It's a new SPAC <laughs> and it's called just another acquisition <laughs> company. And Fantastic. so it's like I, I think that was for, tongue planted firmly in cheek when they did that. But, you know, I, I, I love tickers and stuff, too, to try to say it. So I was wondering. Is it Jack? How do you how do you pronounce it? Trying to say they're a jack of all trades. I mean, I, I don't know. I thought it, I thought it was clever though. But yeah, you know, one thing we haven't touched upon. You know, you've you've talked about the reflation and the profitability. Mm -hmm. Let's let's move the re and put an in in front of it because people have been discussing very significantly about inflation. We've seen the bond market perk up lately. Um, some of that's the Fed's footprint in there, kind of mm -hmm. uh, distorting break evens a bit. We've seen really continued fervor. We've seen fund flows. It's on everyone's mind. At least it's at least a discussion point. People are talking about roles of commodities and things again. How are you thinking about inflation? Is it transitory? Is it a new regime? I, I, I've already just broke Bob Farrell's rule. But there is no new regime. <laughs> uh, but the point being is like, are, should we be more concerned about it? Is that something you're thinking about in your portfolios as well? And if so, how are you trying to incorporate that into your analysis? Yep, Jeff, Jeff, it's definitely uh, something in our portfolios right now. And I want to say the, the one difference, you know, I think most, most people viewing this are probably saying, oh, well, Rich just said that. How high does he think inflation is going to go? And I think that's the wrong question. I don't think you should ask how high inflation is going to grow. I think you should say, what's the probability that inflation could be higher and or last longer than people think, right? If, if the consensus is 2.1 or 2.2% inflation, it turns out to be two and a half to three, you win. Right. If, if people think it's three and it turns out to be 3.3, .3, you win. You know, I, I don't think you have to put a 
a decimal point forecast on that, you just have to say, what's the probability? Take the over under. And right now I'd say we're taking the over. Um, so, and, and same with the longer. Why are we doing that? It's no one factor, right? I, I, people just say, oh, look at money supply or look at this or look at that. For us, it's a combination of little events that seem to suggest that something's changing in the background. And the one that I've pointed to recently is that for many years, people could say, uh, you know, the United States was importing deflation, that, that import prices were rising more slowly than CPI. And therefore, the more goods you brought in from outside the United States, you had downward pressure on the CPI. And that was basically correct, except in the last couple of months now, we're starting to import inflation. Right. Core import prices are rising faster than core CPI. So, you know, is it, is it hugely meaningful? No. Is it, is it changed? Yes, absolutely. And, and those are the type of things I don't think people are paying attention to. I mean, Bank of America Merrill Lynch came out today with a forecast of uh, their forecast of, of the output gap. And it was kind of the first time I had seen, maybe you guys have seen it, but I haven't seen anybody actually put out a forecast of the output gap that actually shows various scenarios. And their baseline scenario says the output gap is gonna close. And we could have something that we haven't seen in 20, 30 years. Again, a change, right? But to me, that's the important thing to look at, that the things in the background are changing, not that we're going to wake up tomorrow, it's going to be 1979. I mean, that seems silly to me. Um, so we're, we're, we are definitely um, skewed towards more inflation than people think. And that's how our portfolios are constructed right now. Yeah. Yeah, I, th I think the same way about it, too. Uh, when we think about rates, it's the same thing. It's not the level that matters because it gets into the psychosis, right? It's that unexpected change Absolutely. that does it, right? And that's yep. the biggest shock. But I think, Sam, you had a question? Was, yeah, I did. And I was just going to say, also, on top of that rates, it's just the rate of the change itself, right? And, and how much, mm -hmm. how quickly it moves you know, in right. addition to the span of time. But you know, as we're talking about inflation and just you know, understanding the impact that can have in the portfolios, what are some of the, the ways that investors can think about adding some protection into the portfolio? Yeah, I mean, well, you guys, you guys at Double Line know better than me on some of this on the fixed income side. I mean, you know, we're not a dedicated fixed income investor. So, and we're not, we don't have dedicated income portfolios. So we don't, we don't look at things like, like tips and all those kind of things, which is what most financial advisors immediately, it's like a knee jerk reaction. You say inflation, they say tips, right? And, and that's, for us, because we're more total return investors, we think we can get a lot more bang for our buck out of things like energy stocks than out of tips, right? And and that sort of thing. So so we are uh, overweight, you know, energy and commodity stocks. Uh, we have um, more recently we have positions in commodity related emerging markets and things like that. I mean, we're trying very hard to play that. We've had gold in our portfolio for a long time, uh, probably about hmm, almost six years now. Um, you know, because gold, we view gold as a pretty good hedge against uncertainty, and uncertainty can can manifest itself in many different ways. Um, uh, for a long time, it was kind of political and economic uncertainty, and gold did did reasonably well. We'll see what happens if if that continues. We we've got up to about nine percent in gold. We're now down to about five. Um, we're pretty comfortable with that now. Um, uh, you know, things like that. We're we're just trying to to look at. Uh, stocks and or bonds that benefit from increases in nominal growth, right? If it's, if it's monster real growth and not a lot of inflation or any combination of inflation and real, we don't really care. We just want a lot of nominal growth. And we think nominal growth is probably going to surprise on the upside. Yeah, we've been seeing a lot of revisions to those forecasts too coming out, especially after the retail sales uh, right. number that came out last week, right? And where yep. people are realize that you know you get new stimulus checks people can spend some money too um, right. so as you as you think about the positioning now and you think about the fiscal policies too we haven't talked a lot of macro and i know you're a big mm -hmm. macro guy and you, you use that to influence the, the way you think about asset allocation but as you, as you really think about these fiscal policies we've been so entrenched in the last decade of monetary policy and, mm. and fiscal struggling at times um how are you thinking about is it just purely to generate nominal growth is that really the core tenet uh, and how are you thinking about the divergence in policies uh, ar right. around the globe today? 
Well, I, you know, I, I, I am probably one of the biggest uh, cynics or skeptics. I'm not quite sure what the right word is there about Washington that, that you'll ever meet. And, and, um, you know, from my perspective, the goal of Washington is always to get reelected. That's, that's the big goal. Um, you know, we like to think that they have, there's this greater good out there. I'm, I'm very skeptical as to whether that greater good exists anymore. And I think it's all about getting reelected. Um, with that in mind, I, I think it's very important to, by our, to understand by our reckoning, 2020, if you take the combination of the change in monetary policy and the change in fiscal policy, it was the biggest stimulus like ever. I mean, you just it, it, off the charts. If you had to do a scatter diagram of the change in fiscal policy, change in monetary policy, the, the, the point is like way up in, uh, you know, it's off the chart. And, and so that's 2020. And, and we haven't probably felt the full effect of that yet. It's not like everything knee jerks and, and shows up in GDP in 10 minutes. It takes a while. So now we're going to get more fiscal stimulus on top of that. And the Fed has told everybody who will listen that they are going to err on the side of more nominal growth rather than less nominal growth. So, you know, people have said, you know, oh, Rich, is there going to be a big bear market? My argument is I'm having trouble figuring out how there could be a big curl your toes bear market when we've got monetary and fiscal stimulus basically with the spigot wide open um, as far as the eye can see. So, you know, that can distort markets and it can, it can do bad things to the economy. I'm not saying it's all good, but I, I think one should expect um, to use the, the economic term, once you expect aggregate demand to pick up over the next year or so, I mean, I think that's a pretty good guess that that's going to happen. And I don't think anybody in Washington, whether it be the Fed or whether it be on the fiscal side, nobody's going to stand in the way of that. Because if you stand in the way of that, you're heading right towards the 2020, 2022 midterms. Right. I don't think anybody wants to get in the way of that. Well, that's that's the vicious cycle of of Congress, right? There's always midterms, in, uh, in addition to the the oh. kind of uh, four every four year type of election, too. You know, I, I tend to ask a lot of people about risk, and one thing I, I want to kind of flip that today and say, what's the most underappreciated reward you actually see in the market today? Something that people aren't really looking at that you think has good potential. Again, it doesn't have to be a single name yep. or anything, but thematically, what what is one of these underappreciated rewards that you see? that can be dominant over the next three, five, 10 type of years. Right, I think that, that right now, people are too caught up in secular stories. I think that's one of the big things in the equity market are these secular stories. And people forget that a cycle always gets in the way of a secular story. A cycle, a down cycle can accentuate a secular story, but an up, uh, up cycle can derail it from an investment point of view, not from the economic point of view, from the investment point of view. And I think that, um, there's many that uh, secular themes that are ready to be derailed right now because most of them are long duration equity themes. Most people understand the concept of a long duration bond and how you don't want to own a long duration bond when interest rates go up. People forget you have long duration equity strategies as well, and they don't tend to work real well when interest rates go up either. So here we have an environment where people are kind of in agreement that long term interest rates are more likely to go up than down but yet they're still enthralled with venture capital, right? That, that makes no sense to me. It's like, wait, that's <laughs> the longest duration equity strategy you can think of, but yet you don't want to hold bonds. So you're, but you're going to, and that doesn't make sense to me. So what are some of those kind of cyclical themes that could derail the secular? Well, my favorite, which um, maybe in some circles is infamous, is traditional energy. Um, now I get, I get the green, I get, you know, that there's disruptive technologies and energy and that's all going to happen. And we should, um, from my point of view, we should embrace it, right? Why should we embrace technology to buy a green pepper on the internet, but we won't embrace technology and energy? I, I don't understand that, but be that as it may. Over the, if you think about the combination of investors shunning traditional energy for various reasons, could be ESG, could be they think there's no cash flow coming, all these kind of things. And the combination of the of the global economy heating up again, I personally think that is the place where you have the greatest supply demand mismatch over the next one, two, three years. I, I really think that's a tremendous opportunity. I, I'm all over the the green themes. I understand that. That's really a five or ten or fifteen year or twenty year theme. It's not a five or ten or fifteen month theme. 
And that's where I think people are missing out. They're forgetting about that, those kind of relationships. So I would put energy at the top of the list. I mean, you know, the weather now is not doing anything to increase uh, energy uh, uh, supply. So right. that, that makes it even, even better. I, I know a lot of people are going to find that terribly distasteful, but that's not my day job. I'm, I'm reasonably dispassionate about a lot of those kind of things. Um, I think the, um, I think to some extent, there is a theme out there that investors kind of understand, but don't really understand. And that is that the United States infrastructure is like a developing world infrastructure these days. I mean, we can't, we can't compete on a global basis with the infrastructure that we have right now. I don't know how to solve that problem because government is, is loath to get involved and create public goods and make things better. But I, we are in dire need of things like the, the you know, the, the, the highway system, the build out of the highway system after, after World War II and, and during the Cold War and, and things like that. And as a country, we have like no interest in it. You know, we want to pave roads so you don't get a flat tire. I get that personally. I get that given that I had a flat tire recently from hitting a pothole. I, I understand that. But that's not really what's going to do it. It's, it's, it's a much needed thing. And, and I, I don't understand this kind of public private partnership stuff, the whole thing. It's like, this is one of our country's biggest needs. I think if you can figure out a way to invest in that long term, I actually think you'll do better than, than um, Bitcoin or the Fab Five or something like that. I think, I think you'll do a little bit better. Well, I think that's actually a good argument uh, for all of the ESG type of investors out there, right? They want to focus on all these social goods and the environment and obviously corporate governance. but Thinking about you know just infrastructure, there's safety issues. You Absolutely. mentioned the pothole. I, I did that two two years ago. I think I hit a pothole on the way to work. It sounded like um, I was in an F-15 fighter and a missile oh lock God. went off. It was yeah. horrible. And and then uh, one of the analysts on the team, he then tells me like, "What were you doing? Just not paying attention?" I'm like it was just there. I was going to hit another car, right? <laughs> yeah, and, exactly. and he shamed me into like hitting a pothole, and I'm like, "Well, they're <laughs> everywhere, right?" So. Uh, but I do think that that is something that's extremely important too. And and you mentioned the energy side, like they, they can coexist. These things can coexist. And, Absolutely. And, yeah. and we're seeing that across the commodity pot complex is just the lack of investment. The underinvestment's been there and you can't just flip a switch when it comes to the supply right. side with all this stuff. And so, right. you know, I think people are still in the old narrative of that oversupply, all this stuff. I did get a couple of texts from uh, people saying, Oh, now that Biden's in, he's going to shut down the oil industry. There's going to be no pipeline jobs. Like, you know, is should I buy energy or not buy it? You know, is it going to zero? Is it going to infinity? It's like, it's neither, right? So, right, uh, I think, exactly. you know, th th those stories are very important. So, um, Rich, uh, it's been a great time. As always, I enjoy the conversation with you. It's, it's been too long. We need to do this more frequently, at least sure. even without a recording. But before we let you go, uh, Sam is over there smirking. I think it's time for his favorite part of the show. Let me uh, turn off my. Actually, someone's calling. Uh, actually, room. someone's yeah. calling. Let him know it's the favorite time of the yeah, show. I guess so. Right. 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 Me about that. So, my favorite part of the show, Rich, is called Sherman Says, and that's where I will offer a series of alternating prompts between you and Mr. Sherman to get a top of mind response. So I'm going to kick it off with Mr. Sherman with Dr. Copper. He's signaling a boom. All right. Assuming it's a he. I got criticized one time on TV <laughs> for calling Dr. Copper. Uh, uh, he so um, gender neutral copper is signaling there is a, there is this, a surging demand for sure. There you have it, Mr. Bernstein. Barbell uh, portfolios. Barbell barbell portfolios. barbell portfolios. Um, interesting. Um, if you're moving in one direction or the other, it's good. But to sit with a barbell portfolio, you're in the middle of the road and you're not really making any commitments one way or the other. Barbells are intermediaries as you're going from one extreme to the other. You don't want to sit there for a long period of time with a barbell. Love it. It would be the perfect hedge, right? Yeah. Um, let's see here. Back to Mr. Sherman with financial transaction taxes. Uh, looks like it's coming. You know, they're, af they're after all this commission-free trading and everything, too. Obviously, you know, Rich put some good comments out there about our politicians. They're more interested in getting reelected. <laughs> um, I can't think of a, a worse set of people to put in. Uh, new policies, right? They don't really understand it. I think they they proved that last week at the testimonies uh, that we saw there that they really don't understand some of the basics. So, um, you know, look, uh, they're going to talk about commission free. I think it was AOC that said you can afford it. 
you know, to, to pay the tax, right? So uh, just because you can afford it doesn't mean you want to pay it either. So um, again, you know, they're, they're going to look to pay the bills. It's either taxes on financial transactions, on the business, on you and me, on wealthy people. I mean, at some point, taxes have to be paid. So unfortunately, I, I think it's somewhat inevitable. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, those hearings are always elicit uh, some laughter, but they're always cringeworthy, you know, for sure. So uh, back to you, Rich, here with vaccination progress. Vaccination progress. Um, uh, I think Dr. Copper might have an MD because uh, I, I think I think she's telling us that uh, things are going to be OK. You know, nothing's going to progress as quickly as we think, uh, as quickly as we want, but it's probably going to progress. And I just remember Dr. Fauci saying uh, several months ago, maybe even six months ago, that by f this fall, we'll be watching football in stadiums. I, I go by his. I I'll, I'll live, live by him. As our head of our government team said this morning, he called him the Oracle, you know, <laughs> Fauci. So, you know, so uh, I'll give shout out to our, our PM there for saying that. I was like, wow, that guy wants to be played by Brad Pitt. He's an Oracle. I mean, you know, he's, he's killing it, you know, so go Dr. Fauci. Yeah. 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 All right, back to you, Jeff, with first time home buyer. Probably a tough proposition, just given the, how much uh, prices have went up and just uh, wages and the like. So it's challenging. I have seen that there's they're talking about new home home buyer credits or first time home buyer credits coming and things, but it's definitely challenging. As I saw a post uh, last week uh, on on someone snarky on Twitter says, you know, hey, you can't qualify for this loan to 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 a thousand dollar a month mortgage, but uh, keep paying fourteen hundred dollars a month in rent, right? So um, you know, there's there is those challenges there, and you know, the strength of the housing market is is going to be a challenge going forward. So, um, you know, uh, save your money, you know, try to try to focus, get the down payment, do the right things, and um, hopefully uh, you can get into it. All right, uh, inflationary pressures. Inflationary pressures, building, building. It's not like a pressure cooker. Um, we're not going to we're not going to relive quite the 1970s just yet, but um, but I think as I said before, if you had to take the over under on inflation, I'm taking the over. All right, Treasury market. If I'm taking the over under on the Treasury market, I'm going over just with Rich here. We're just doing it a different way. Uh, <laughs> rate rates have been really weak. Um, it looks a bit you know it looks a fair amount oversold right now. But on a fundamental basis, a lot of things we look at, whether it's the relationship with nominal GDP, things like uh, Ms. Copper, you know, relative to gold, um, you know, what we find out there is that rates should be higher. We know there's suppression from the Fed, but that we've known about that. So it's that marginal buyer out there. So I just think that um, I'm going to take the over as well here. Um, and it's going to be, um, you know, it, it, I think it's the same thing. It's the pressure cooker. It's slow. Markets can handle it. It's those spikes that, that hurt things. I mean, we're halfway through the taper tantrum at this point, if you think about it. You know, rates are up about almost 50 basis points here to date, by 45 or so today. That's, you know, I think we did 110 during taper tantrum, roughly or so, uh, which freaked everybody out. But um, it's been well, well absorbed at this point. And I, you know, I just don't really see it being a hiccup. It's just a repricing at this point. So uh, I'm going to take the over as well. All right. Back to you, Rich, with vacation. Vacation. I'm. What is that? I'm not sure. I, I quite remember what a vacation is. Uh, um, yeah, I mean, they'll come back. I. I mean, I'd. I'd love to. Uh, to go on one myself, and uh, I'm sure a lot of people have cabin fever. Um, but uh, I think I. It'll come back. It'll be slow. You know, the data. The data from China even was was a pretty good. Um, uh, a guide for what would happen here, where production data came back very quickly, but anything related to social interaction took a very long time to come back. And I think we're going to see that here. It's only human nature. So, so I think, well, we will eventually be taking vacations again. Yes. But yeah, uh, I, I consider a vacation when I close the laptop shell, you know, for the day, that's my vacation. <laughs> exactly. but, and then, yeah, I, I buy the pent up demand argument, but it's one, it's a one-time thing. It's not like you're going to go on five vacations this year um, to do it, so. Yeah, exactly right, exactly right. All right, so let's go into the final round with corporate credit to Mr. Sherman. Uh, it's in good shape. I mean, look, it, 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 it has a high debt burden. The service cost is relatively low. We know interest service um, is, is, is manageable in the short term, uh, which is what matters right now. Um, the, the, the fate of returns, as Rich was pointing out, is based on valuation, right? 
And the problem with the credit market is that they've extended out the maturities of this debt significantly over the last few years, uh, namely last year as well. And that means you have significantly more duration in these assets. So the fate of the corporate credit market goes with the fate of treasury. So if you don't like treasuries, you probably should rethink a lot of those investment grade bond, corporate bonds you own in the portfolio, or at least manage them a bit differently. So um, I don't think it's a default problem. I agree with Rich on this idea that you know we're going to start to grow again. We're gonna usurp nominal GDP likely this year from where we were in DC of 19. And there's a lot of positive attributes, but that doesn't make it a good investment. Um, and if that if that if that forecast comes to fruition, it's likely you'll continue to see a negative sign on the investment rate corporate returns for 2021. All right, and the last one goes to you, Rich, with New York City. <laughs> New York City, where I where I am right here. Um, I, I would say um, New York City is also bifurcated, um, as, as is the stock market. You've got the residential areas where I live. Um, which are okay. I mean, they're not booming by any means, but they're okay. You know, you're actually starting to see uh, new restaurants come around. Uh, you can see them, re you know, building and refurbishing the old restaurants that went out of business. You know, a lot of people said New York restaurants are the perfectly competitive marketplace that we saw in, that we were taught in uh, elementary economics. And that might be true. And then you got Midtown. And Midtown is still pretty much a ghost town. And that's going to depend uh, a lot on um, how many businesses come back and work and everything else. I will tell you in our firm, what we have done is our lease was running out. We have negotiated a sublet from a company who believes that they are never coming back. And brand new installation, they were supposed to take go in right before the pandemic started and they basically never came in. And so we're saying, fine, we'll, we'll take that off your hands at a discount. And uh, so we're locked in at a pretty good rent for the next six years, uh, trying to take advantage of what I think has been a very emotional decision and emotional coverage. The only thing I would add on top of that is that I think, you know, a lot of people have pointed to New York and to San Francisco as places that are doomed. I don't think people have thought this through. I think cities in general are doomed if you believe that, right? Last I looked, commuting in Los Angeles was not exactly easy. Commuting in, in, L, in Atlanta is not exactly easy. The, you know, Atlanta is like the 38th biggest city in the country. It's not one of the top five or 10. Cities in general are gonna have trouble. I don't think this is a selective thing that's just gonna hit New York and, and San Francisco. I think cities in general, would be in trouble. I'm not that bearish. I don't think cities are going to be in trouble. Um, it will take a while to come back, but you know, I, I just think there's there's an emotional response here that, as a firm, we've tried to take advantage of. No, it makes sense. When when Lau said that, the New York City reminded me of those old Pace Picani uh, commercials too, where the guy's talking about his, his salsa not being from Texas, and, <laughs> and there's a lot of different. It was New York City, yeah. So that was a good one. So anyway, Rich, um, I I always enjoy. it. Like I said, it's great banter to uh, just love the love the passion you bring to it. So uh, for our listeners who aren't familiar with RBA and the likes. How can they get in touch with you? How can they follow uh, what you guys are sure. putting out there? So the, thank you, Jeff, for, for bringing that up. The, the best way for people to get, a, to get a hold of us is, is look at our website. It's rbadvisors.com, rbadvisors.com. There are, there are several links on there, you know, like contact us and that type of thing. And it's got our marketing desk phone number, which I don't know off the top of my head, um, which is I should be prepared better. But um, uh, there's a marketing desk that's, that's manned. People will direct you to the right to the right place or you can contact us via the website and uh you know it's, it's got lots of good information up there okay one point that we've been having an internal debate how does one spell advisor <laughs> we've always done it o-r yeah me too advisor. but we've been getting pushed back our style guides now say er and i'm like wait a second this isn't uh, right you know i uh, i've been trying to rebel but you can't fight change right so yeah. rba advisors with an o correct with an o correct okay. exactly okay. well rich we appreciate the time you spent with us thank you so much and your time's valuable uh for those of you that uh, didn't catch this on youtube and want to see it you can follow us on our youtube site youtube.com backslash double line capital that's capital with an A, not an O. We're not a, we're not a monument uh, either since we're on that. Uh, also, you know, SoundCloud, Stitcher, Spotify, iTunes, Google Play, all those great places that podcasts are hosted. You can hear this again. And so we appreciate the time. Uh, tune, in, uh, tune in shortly. We're going to have another great guest. 
probably not as good as Rich, but definitely <laughs> good, getting there for the high quality. So thanks again, Rich. Thanks, thanks for your time. Guys. We really appreciate it. Yeah, okay. pleasure being with you. Thanks so much.